today with Julie Dominic, who is an occupational therapist here at Mercy Hospital, and she works in the driver rehabilitation program here. Julie, I know that you have a lot of other initials after after your name, and I was just wondering if you would explain to us what some of those initials mean. Sure. Um, I'm also a CDRS, which is a Certified Driver Rehabilitation Specialist, as well as I'm a licensed driving instructor for the state of Ohio who can work with people with disabilities. Okay, I was really excited when I heard that there is a driver rehab program here at Mercy because it just seems like something that there's a real need for. You know, a lot of times you hear about people who are concerned that their loved ones are maybe not reacting as quickly as they used to or, um, you know, starting to get in accidents or little fender benders. And I was just wondering, what brings people to you? I mean, typically is it uh, a doctor that's ordering it or somebody that comes on their own and says, hey, I think I may have a problem? Usually, the, the majority of the people that I see are people that have been referred to me by a physician because the physician is aware of their um, medical status and maybe some changes in that medical status. So oftentimes, uh, I would say probably 95% of the time, my referrals are from a physician, um, which is a good thing because then I know that that person is medically stable to be able to tolerate or even look at driving because uh, obviously you don't want to have them have any medical issues that are acutely a problem or, or something that needs to be addressed. What, what kind of um, diagnoses do you typically see? You know, what, what kind of a patient might have issues with driving safely? Well, and I see people across this lifespan. Um, I do see some younger people that have some congenital problems uh, such as cerebral palsy or spina bifida or even some autism or learning disabilities. But on the other side of that, I see people with various medical issues. For example, um, a stroke or a head injury or some progressive uh, problems such as multiple sclerosis. Parkinson's disease, dementia, um, Alzheimer's is, is a type of dementia that I see, um, or somebody that maybe has had a spinal cord injury. So I can see a, a very wide variety of folks that have various problems um, because all of those things can affect their ability to drive safely. So, Okay. Basically, when you see somebody, what, what would be the first thing that you would do? Um, the, the first thing that I do is they do fill out an intake form to give me a history of their medical history as, in addition to the medications they take because that, that really falls uh, very heavily into driving um, and whether or not they can take care of themselves at home for self-care issues as well as home issues um, and then also look at a driving history so that's that's the first part that I take for them so that I can get an idea of what their background is and what their current functional level is. After that I do a clinical assessment and, and one of the first things that is important is their vision status. So they have to meet the BMV, um, the Ohio BMV vision requirements uh, at a minimum in order for me to continue with the assessment. So that is one of the first clinical things that I do after I get to know them a little bit and have that interview process. After that, is it, you know, like written work at the table here or, um, you know, I'll show a picture in a minute of a simulator you have there um, and I think you said you use that strictly for reaction times. Yes, yes, and I do, a lot of what I do is paper pencil type testing. Um, I look at uh, visual perceptual skills, which is how we make sense of what we see. Um, that's, that's a real important one for driving, as well as some cognitive issues, organization, memory, concentration, different types of attention. Um, there, there's all different kinds of visual attention that are real important for driving. So that's another thing that I will look at very um, closely. And I also do a physical assessment to make sure that their body is, is moving and working well enough for driving. Um, I do have the simulator and it can be adapted with hand controls because I do adaptive equipment assessment as well and also um, I've got those issues in the car or those options in the vehicle that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but that is strictly to see if they can get from the gas to the brake quick enough. Mm -hmm. um, and there are standards for all of the testing that I do, there are normals and standards that I kind of compare their behavior to. So a lot of this <clears throat> is objective, but I'm, I'm assuming that some subjective view comes into play also. Oh, absolutely. And, and 
depending on um, their support system, that's a big, huge part of this. You know, if somebody has a spouse at home that can share the driving or can even observe their behavior and monitor and make sure that they're staying on track or if they have any changes, um, that's a that's a big one. As well as um, looking at what their uh, what their resources are with regards to how they can access the community in other ways. Um, you know, if, if they're aware of things out there. And so there are a lot of other factors that we need to look at um, in addition to just what the, the objective results of those clinical tests are. So is, does this all happen in one day or is it several sessions? Um, usually an assessment, which is how I start all of the folks that I see, usually ends up being about two to three hours in length. And um, I would say two-thirds of that time is spent in the clinic setting, and then the last third of the time is spent in the car. I do have a vehicle here at Mercy Medical Center that is adapted as a student driver vehicle. It has a passenger brake on the, the passenger side in the front, and I will take that person on a comprehensive um, course of sorts that starts in a parking lot and works into to various traffic situations, ending up on the highway, the interstate's right here close to the medical center, um, if that's appropriate for that person. So, so that's usually the length of time it takes. Okay. Well, let's talk about the cost of this. Um, you had mentioned earlier that sometimes a doctor's order is involved. Mm -hmm. I, I would assume that helps you know, with insurance payment, does insurance cover this? Yes, insurance, as a matter of fact, does cover outpatient occupational therapy, which is what I bill the service as. Um, and most insurances, including Medicare carriers, um, do find this reimbursable because it's a functional community mobility assessment because I'm looking at the whole person and their ability to access the community. Um, so in lots of documentation and things that we need to do to, to meet the requirements of those insurance carriers, we do follow those, those um, indicators. And so yes, in most cases, I would say there are some private insurances that are less likely, but we do pre-authorize all of our assessments here that are billed through the insurance. Now, if they don't come with a doctor's order, mm -hmm. I'm not able to bill that, that um, assessment to insurance, and then we do offer private pay options. Mm -hmm. And the hospital, because it's a nonprofit medical center, will offer a 40% discount of the cost, which is usually around eh, between five and seven hundred dollars total, because I spend two to three hours of, of um, clinic time and, and mm -hmm. on the road time with that person. So, so there is that option if, if the person would be private pay. Okay, I can see that this would be a touchy subject to broach with a parent. You know, if you're seeing problems, do you have any ideas on on a sensitive way that a that a son or a daughter might? you know, initiate that conversation? Well, and, and you know, uh, most of the, the resources that are out there, and there's some wonderful resources, the AAA puts out some great information if, if people have access to the internet with regards to the need to talk about driving early on. So if you know that you have an older person in your family and you're concerned about how they're doing with driving, you know, start that conversation way early. Um, for example, you can say to them, you know, mom or dad, um, you know, there might become a time down the road that this is not going to be a safe idea for you anymore. So we need to keep that in mind so we start making up those backup plans or just start thinking about that. That helps open up the subject matter to them so when it does come Mm -hmm. to be a difficult situation that it's already been talked about a little bit it's a whole lot easier for somebody to accept that conversation if they've already had previous ones so that's one of the best ways another really wonderful thing is to get in the car with your loved one um, if you're if you're a, a, a child of a, a aging parent and you're concerned just drive to the store with them as a passenger and be an observer because then you can start to see oh my gosh wow they really are having difficulty judging their distances or pulling out in front of somebody or hesitating too long so that's a really wonderful way and and to do that on a regular basis at least once a month is what's recommended okay so here you are assessing the person's skill are there is there anything that can be done to make a person a better driver? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. None of us are the best drivers we can be. That's, yeah. that's my first <laughs> thing. We can all do a better job. So there's a lot of suggestions, and I am a driving instructor at heart, so I 
when I'm out in the car with those people, I will give them suggestions of ways that they can improve their driving skills. And a lot of times, older people especially, um, aren't, aren't necessarily as defensive as they need to be. So a lot of it's just educating them on what defensive driving techniques are and teaching them some of those things. So absolutely. And, and I, do, I am a driving instructor, so I do do driver training in certain situations. And sometimes um, people will call me and, and ask for that service um, on the side. That I don't, I'm not able to bill to insurances because it is it is a training piece um, but sometimes people will will opt for that um, just to improve their driving skills or okay. if they need adaptive equipment and Julie I, I know you t to be a very compassionate person how do you deal with and how how do you recommend a family deals with when you have to tell a person you can't drive anymore well and and that's a very good question and never an easy easy decision to make um, we, first of all, the term that, that I like to use is retirement from driving, and you'll see that in some of the literature, which is a really nice way to look at it because, you know, driving is a privilege. It is something that you need to demonstrate the skill level to be out there and be doing it. And, you know, a lot of older people have retired from, from jobs or, or occupations, and retiring from driving is a kind of another large life adjustment that they have to look at. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the entire time I'm seeing them, I'm getting an idea of, of where we're going, and, and I have those conversations conversations a little early on about retirement um, and, and with that if that's what the recommendation is and I'm reporting that to the doctor who also then backs me up on that um, is that I support that person and, and tell them that you know life is going to change but it's not over there's alternative transportation options there's other resources in the community and I try to give them that follow-up and that support um, that I can to make that a little bit easier. Um, and there's a lot of things that I give the families as well to, to talk about that information because sometimes there's more follow-up than in the time that I can see them sure. that, that needs to take place. What do you do with the car? What, you know, There's a lot of things that, that go along with that. So, Are there other driver rehab programs in the Stark County area? No. We are Mercy Medical Center is the only driver rehab rehab mm -hmm. program in Stark County and many of the surrounding counties. Now if you go north from here, um, there is another program in Akron as well as several in the Cleveland area. And then you have to go south to Mansfield, Columbus, any of the larger cities have several. But our outlying areas tend not to have a lot of people that do what I do. So yes, we, we are the only one here locally, but um, there are others that do similar work in okay. other places in Ohio. Well Julie, I was wondering if you could give people uh, your phone number or the best way to reach you here? Sure, sure. Um, you can reach the Driver Rehabilitation Program and talk to me specifically or talk to our receptionist. Um, the number is 330-489-1135 and we welcome calls and questions um, just even if you're curious about our services further. So please feel free to call. Thank you very much. Thank you.